Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Profector Podcast. This episode will be in English as today's guest is Nick Coots, co-founder and former CEO of Fitness Hut. Nick studied sports at the University of Birmingham. He worked for Holmes Place, becoming Iberia CEO until 2010. In 2010, he decided to leave Holmes Place and in less than a year started Fitness Hut with two other business partners. Fitness Hut quickly became the market leader in gym and fitness providers in Portugal. Since selling Fitness Hut in January 2018, Nick is also a bar, bar a board member for AGAP, Europe Active, and Viva Gym, in which he is also an investor. Nick is also an investor in several apps like Sister, Killing Kittens, and Moto Sumo, the latter being a fitness app based in Denmark, in which Nick is also chairman of the board. On another note, Nick is a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt in which he competes regularly. Thank you very much, Nick, and we hope you enjoy this episode. Yeah, so, so um, I, I thought I'd talk about two books, if I can. I mean, they're quite different because one is a novel. So, I mean, I read a lot. Um, my, one of my great pastimes is reading novels, sort of losing myself in, in, in books. Um, and then the other one is more of a management book. Um, so I could talk about both of them. And both of them, uh, well, what the novel is called A Small Death in Lisbon. Uh, by Robert Wilson, so he's an, an English author. Um, and the other book is called Blue Ocean Strategy, which you may have heard of, uh, which is written by two authors. Uh, one is Korean, one's American. I think his name is W. Chan Kim, and hers is, I think, Rene Mourgoua, or something like that. <laughs> and they work in INSEAD, in the, in the French um, um, business school. So I'm not sure which one you'd like me to talk about first, but maybe it doesn't matter. Whatever you want. Yeah, to okay. So A Small Death in Lisbon is, uh, I would rank that in my top three books of all time. And I have read a lot of books. I'm, I'm talking about novels. I mean, I, I read, I'm always reading novels, so two or three novels at any one time. And I put that right up there in my top three. And uh, firstly... The genre, so it's it's set in, well, a part of it is set in World War II, which I'm fascinated by. Uh, and the other thing is the location, because it's set right here, hence the name. And uh, it starts off, it's, it spans three generations, so it starts off, I think, in 1941. Um, and of course, as you undoubtedly know, uh, Portugal was neutral in the war. And uh, it's not just set in Portugal and Lisbon, but it's very much set between Lisbon and Cascais and Estoril. So really, really relevant, quite exciting. Uh, there's lots of uh, uh, you know, places which one recognises. And uh, I was learning, it actually got me into to reading more about that era uh, for Lisbon and for Estoril. And so it it's essentially starts off, I think, in the late 90s or the early 90s anyway, where, um, so more or less modern day, um, but not for you guys because it's 30 years ago, but for me, modern day. So a lady or a, a young woman, a girl is murdered brutally and the detective that is trying to discover what's happened to her uh, you know starts investigating and then the whole story kind of switches through right back to 1941 and essentially it pulls together these the, the it follows a family from uh, the wartime right through to modern day and it's linked to um, something which was going on in Portugal which you may know about which was the mining of a precious ore or a precious metal uh, called Wolfram, which was used by the Nazis or by the Germans to fuel their uh, their bombs, essentially their rockets and their bombs. And it's, it talks about how there was essentially this illicit trade going on because um, Portugal had agreed to be neutral and yet they were selling uh, this Wolfram to, to the Germans and then having it transported back to Germany. And uh, it talks about how one of the major banks... Um, which still exists today, essentially was funded, uh, that the founded rather, on the, um, the profits from this uh, illicit trade. And it just talks about, you know, go all, all the way through the Salazar era, which is, is fascinating because, you know, he was essentially, uh, from one point of view, the most successful dictator in history, or certainly of that era, because he lasted so long. And he, uh, for, for all of his many, many, many faults, and the horrific things which went on under his regime. He was very successful in terms of navigating what was rather delicate position for a, a small country in terms of keeping neutral and keeping 
the Allies and the Axis powers calm uh, whilst making sure that his small, uh, basically defenceless country wasn't invaded. Because at any given moment, Portugal could have just been taken by the Nazis as a strategic position, because it was very strategic in terms of being on the Atlantic, etc. Um, so that's, that's also woven into it, which I find is interesting. And it just really cleverly holds together. And then when it comes to the modern day, um, and it's pursuing uh, the suspects and the life story of this girl that's died, or the, sorry, that has been murdered, um, it's describing road by road and largo by largo, Kashkaish. And then I suddenly realized, oh my God, that is the square where my house is. And, and she lives in the house opposite. And it, it's like, it's <laughs> mind blowing, you know, that you're reading a story and you're thinking, wow, she's, she was just over there in, in the book. Uh, so this guy, um, brilliant author, um, Robert Wilson, he wrote a series, unfortunately for me, not enough. You know, the series is too short. I think that they're not connected, but they're, they're following a similar kind of uh, genre, if you like, or subject matter, which essentially is Lisbon during World War II. Uh, and I learned about the espionage and the spying which was going on because we had you know, the two protagonists, the, the, the Brits and the Germans, had their, their headquarters in Estoril. So the Germans had the what's now what was and still is the Palacio Hotel um, and then the Brits had I think the Hotel Londres no surprise and it talks about the how the Estoril Casino was where they would meet at the weekends uh, and there would be dancing etc etc and you know elsewhere in the world these two powers were slaughtering each other and yet here in Portugal Lisbon Estoril it was neutral and they went to essentially to cocktail parties and dances together and occasionally people would be um, kidnapped by the Germans and then transported back to Germany for questioning or whatever. And then the other interesting aspect of it, just to finish off on, on the small death in Lisbon, is this, this terrible uh, tragedy which we all know of as the Holocaust was taking place. And it talks about this, essentially this migration of people, mostly uh, Jews, but also all sorts of other people who are being pursued. Um, across Europe, fleeing west, and of course Portugal is the westernmost part of Europe, they were fleeing west and it talks about and describes how they were, you know, getting f through checkpoints and sneaking around and um, in many cases paying people off to get as far as they could and then there was this kind of, uh, this community in Portugal, in Lisbon, of not quite destitute but definitely homeless people who had got as far as they could and now are trying to work out how they could uh, pay or negotiate or wrangle their way onto the very few ships which were going from Lisbon to the US, which was obviously safety. Mm -hmm. And there were you know, thousands and thousands of these people, some of them destitute, some of them with lots of money, lots of royalty or aristocrats, all living around Lisbon and Estoril. And so there's this kind of mixing of the Nazis, the Brits, these very, very wealthy people from all over Europe and, and Jewish people as well rubbing shoulders with the Portuguese secret police, uh, the Gestapo, etc., but all essentially, you know, safe from a, a certain point of view because within this jurisdiction there was no, well, the Germans weren't able to perpetuate what they were doing elsewhere in Europe. So, um, yeah, that's, that's really one of my top three books and I'd recommend it. Fantastic. Okay. Um, and then uh, a, a very different book, and, and I, don't, I don't read many uh, management books. I went through a phase of reading a lot of management books and uh, I think that most managers or, or people who are leading businesses do this and I think it's a good thing to do uh, but I think I got a little bit burnt out from uh, at one point I was reading like five management books at any one time and, and you know and they've all some of them are very good some of them are a bit boring uh, but um, this one book called Blue Ocean Strategy uh, really actually changed my life completely and uh, it was in, uh, I'd been working as the CEO of Homes Place Health Clubs. And I, I had been running uh, lots of clubs across Europe. So I was the CEO for continental Europe. So seven countries, um, lots and lots of clubs, big business, 100 million turnover. So, you know, I, I'd been doing that for a while. And then we did a management buyout to run the Portuguese and Spanish business. Uh, so I was living, um, living in, in Lisbon and running businesses across these two countries and that was from 2000 and 
five until 2010. But towards the end of my tenure there, uh, we were struggling. The business was struggling. It wasn't doing as well as it had been doing. Uh, that was the economic downturn, but also the fact that, um, well, I wasn't doing a great job, and I think we were trying to, we were trying to sell a premium product. We were marketing ourselves as a premium product, but in reality, we were kind of like, well, we we weren't premium, but we were trying to charge a premium price, which we could do when the economy was good. But as the economy started to deteriorate, it became harder. And I realized I saw this this um, this phenomenon, this concept elsewhere in Europe called called low cost gyms. And uh, I started to look at it and I realized that that actually I identified more with that, with that concept. And I felt that that was the thing which would be the future of, of fitness, at least one of the things I was interested in terms of one option for the future. And I had two options. I thought, well, low cost is going to come to Portugal and Spain and I'm either going to be the guy running the business which is going to get uh, severely attacked by low cost if I stay where I am or I could have the balls to to you know to jump and try and do it myself and so I I left Holmes Place in uh, I think in in September 2010 and in almost exactly a year later we opened our first fitness hut club and um, so fitness hut grew to be the largest operator of clubs in Portugal um, much, much bigger than, than the, the company I was working for before. So it became a, a success over the years. Uh, but the point at which I decided to do it, uh, at that point, I invited two of my colleagues uh, uh, to come with me, uh, who um, we're the three founders of Fitness Hut now, uh, or then. And uh, when we sat down to, to decide what we wanted to... So, so when we... When we decided to, to uh, set up Fitness Hut, we, we had, as you do when you're setting up a new concept or a new, or a new product or a new company, we had several sort of focus groups, just the three of us deciding all aspects of what we wanted to develop and what we wanted to achieve. And one of the principal uh, foundations for, for as we were developing the concept was what has caused us headaches? During, the, during our period of working at Home's Place. You know, what, what are the things which have kept us up at night? What are the things which have caused stress? And how can we avoid them? So it's essentially, how can we avoid... Let's identify the, the six or the eight or the ten headaches which are within our business model, within our practice, and let's see how, as we're building a new concept from the ground up, let's see how we can either mitigate or reduce those headaches or just simply avoid them. And that was quite uh, a sort of an empowering... Um, session. It was quite interesting. And uh, so we started off designing or, or on paper, essentially. And it's lovely for those of you that have, if you've ever started a business compared to worked in a business, you know, it's, it's a really privileged position. It's very liberating. It's very empowering when you're building from zero because, you know, you're basically able to, to take the, the concept and the, and the product and the identity uh, and the values and the behavior you design it all from zero. So, you know, if, if it ends up being something you're not proud of or you don't identify with, you've only got yourself to blame, uh, as opposed to coming into a business which is already all of those things. And trying to change something from the inside when it's already established is obviously much more difficult than uh, starting from zero. So we knew that we were in this great position as we started off, uh, looking at headaches, identifying them, working a way around them. And little did we know that actually what we were doing was something which is described and defined very clearly in um, Blue Ocean Strategy. Now, I can't remember actually how a Blue Ocean Strategy came to me. I don't know if I found it on the Internet or if somebody recommended it to me. I'm not sure. Uh, but Blue Ocean Strategy was, I think, published in 2005. And we were, um, we were doing this work in 2010. And uh, so I got the book, got hold of the book, and it, you know, it's a very, you know, some management books are a bit heavy, quite hard going, at least for me. Um, and this was really easy. You know, I, I read it in an afternoon, basically. And then I had to read it again, because not much stays in the first time. But, you know, it really, I, I identified with it. It was very easy to understand. 
lots of uh, very clear sort of diagrams and, and, and things that which structure, not just, it's not just a concept, it actually leads you through the steps of how to apply this to your thinking, uh, to your processes and to your company, whether it's a new company or an existing company. So I used Blue Ocean Strategy and some of the exercises in Blue Ocean Strategy as we were developing our, our concept, our identity. And the basic tenet of Blue Ocean Strategy is you're going to, well, it's that most businesses and products um, are competing for the same, uh, the same captive audience or the same uh, customers or clients, and they're competing in a red ocean. And why is it red? It's red because all of the fish and the sharks are there killing each other for the same, uh, for the same um, goal, the same uh, customers. Because essentially, most businesses are doing the same as each other, just with some differences. Just, some are doing it better than others. Some are, there's some small adjustments, but basically, whichever sector you look at, basically, uh, you know, one camera maker is the same as another camera maker, uh, computers, etc. Broadly the same, small differences. And so what it argues is within Blue Ocean Strategy, it, it suggests to you that to be successful, um, you should swim towards the blue ocean where there aren't any other fish. And essentially what it's saying is that you are, you're making competition irrelevant because you're doing something, you're designing something which is so different um, that um, what the competitors are doing is, is a non-issue. And so it's, it talks about creating more value for the end user uh, and doing it at a, a cheaper price. And so it helps you analyze uh, your business or your product, break it down and say, I don't like this, so I'm going to do, I'm going to do less of it. Or this is, this is not adding value, so I'm going to do less of it. This also not, so I'm going to remove it completely. And then this does add value, let's increase it or let's put the turbo charges on that and do more of it. And we're going to introduce this, which nobody was doing before. And that's also going to add. So there's these four, there's these four aspects. And when one applies that, bearing in mind this was, this was 10 years ago, uh, you know, we, we were applying that to, to the, the health and fitness sector, uh, which at that time was basically what we would know as a classic gym. That's one, one part of it. And then the health club. Um, but there wasn't the low cost uh, f product uh, at that point. It was just starting in, in some other countries. And so we visited uh, some of those other countries and saw what was going on. And we came back and we thought, we, we can do this, but we can, we're going to adjust it and do it better. We'll apply Blue Ocean Strategy and we will build uh, a product which is very relevant. So it's got to be relevant to, to the consumer uh, and most importantly, completely disruptive to the existing players in the market. So we didn't want to just come in and do, you know, another home's place, but better. We wanted to do something transformational um, and disruptive. And we did that not just with our clubs, but also with our relationship with uh, personal trainers, which is obviously a, bit, a big aspect of, of what we do. And, and yeah, so basically from, in terms of Blue Ocean Strategy, I, whenever I get the opportunity, if I'm talking to people, not just in fitness, but, uh, anyone who's interested to listen to me uh, who might be starting a venture, I say read Blue Ocean Strategy because it's exciting. As you can see, I'm excited talking about it. I mean, it's easy to be excited having applied it and look back over 10 years of growth and success. But from the beginning, if you have the discipline to apply a, a framework, if you like, or an infrastructure, uh, sorry, or a structure a, 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 on top of what you're thinking about doing, it helps make sense of things. And I'm quite a kind of naturally quite a freestyle thinker. I'm all over the place. I don't like structure. I don't like, you know, having to follow things in sequence. But Blue Ocean Strategy made me do that. And it made me do that in a way which I appreciated. So it wasn't, it wasn't heavy. It was quite simple. And uh, I think it added tremendous value. So um, great book. Those are my two books. Uh, I wanted to ask you a question related to the Blue Ocean Strategy book, which is, I was look. I was skimming through the ideas yesterday, mm. and I was wondering, how did you? In your case, it was it was a similar area, which was fitness and yeah. gym ownership. Yeah. But how would you balance purely looking for a blue ocean with finding something that you're passionate for? I mean, I know. The, yeah. More on a personal opinion, in your opinion, on this. 
Yeah, look, I mean, I think, um, first of all, I mean, I, I talked to my, my kids about, you know, because it's funny how, I remember when I was, when I finished university, I still didn't know what I wanted to do. But I think there's, there's maybe there's, might depend upon the person, or maybe these days it's the case that it seems to me that kids are, they either they're put under pressure or they put pressure on, the, on themselves to try to decide what they want to be from quite a young age. So I'm telling my 15 year old, don't worry about it, you know, uh, and because they're choosing GCSEs or IB and they're thinking that they need to be following a certain path. And, uh, and they occasionally ask me for advice uh, or my opinion for what it's worth. And the number one thing I say to them is pursue the thing you love or the things you love because it's so much easier to be good at the stuff you enjoy. You know, it, I mean, if you're great at, uh, at maths, okay, but don't do maths because you think you've got to do maths. If, if, you, if you're not very good at maths, don't worry about it, you know. And if you're good at, and, and it, it doesn't, you know, people also sort of think, well, you know, uh, and I have a degree in sport, so which you know, so I'm a bit biased. Uh, but some people think that well, that's not a proper degree. But you know, in the end, as long as you're doing um, pursuing the thing you, that you love, it's much easier to be good at it. And I think um, there's a kind of a bit of a cheesy expression, which is if you if you do the thing you love uh, as a job, you'll never work a day in your life. Um, so I think if people are starting out and they're thinking about Blue Ocean strategy, I would argue that you have to know what the thing is first. And my advice is make sure the thing is something you really enjoy, or you get pleasure from, because it's much easier to be good at that. So if you're an investor, it's slightly different, because then you're just putting money into a project. But, but people who invest in companies, um, they're investing really in the, in the people who are driving the project first and foremost. So, you know, when I, I make some investments and um, I have to think the sector is interesting. I have to think the product is, is different. But most importantly, I need to feel that the people who are the founders or the leaders of the project are really all over it and that they really are passionate about it. So I think, you know, you have to, if you're talking to me about or asking me the question about people starting off a business and Blue Ocean Strategy, they have to be sure that they're developing or going into a business which they really love, first of all, and then apply Blue Ocean, Blue Ocean Strategy. Uh, on top of that, when you're talking about the four actions to creating Blue Ocean Strategy, uh, I've seen some things that, that Fitness Hub does, for example, the workout of the week, which yeah. I personally I find it fun when I'm there and you see something different, it's yeah. competitive, and you have the, the board, but what else did you feel that you had to raise the standards of in fitness under the banner of Fitness Hub here in Portugal? Um, well, one of the main things we do um, which I think, it, look, I don't want to sound arrogant, <laughs> but, but I'm definitely proud, let's put it that way, about some things. I, and I appreciate that some things need to be improved, but if you're asking me specifically about which things do we identify as wanting to set ourselves apart and be, let's say, pioneering, exciting, market leaders, those kinds of things, <clears throat> I would say two things um, come to mind. One, you said the, the workout of the week, which I think is good, but in reality, a relatively small percentage of members do it. I think it's cool, and those that do it love it. Um, but but if I think about a couple of things we do, which are let's say which reach a, a broader number of members, one would be the gym-based classes. So we, as you know, we have group fitness classes in studios, which is obviously traditional. There's nothing blue ocean or pioneering about that. But we also launched right at the beginning, these four classes, which are short classes, which take place in the gym, which you don't need to book for. And you know, you see the gym instructor going around inviting people to come and do the abs class, these short sort of 10 minute classes or the, or the mobility class or the, um, the functional training class, those kinds of things. And by the objective there is to try to essentially educate people about the reality of working out and getting a good workout without using equipment. So it's trying to essentially open people's minds because the old school of working out is you go to the gym, you follow your program on a bit of paper and it might be you know, a 20 minute run on a treadmill and then you go three times around a sequence of, 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 of equipment. But the, myself and, and my partners were very committed to uh, functional training. That's, that's one of the things we love. And for me, that's, you know, it's not CrossFit, it's not athletic training, it's not bodyweight training. It's a whole range of things 
but the probably the common denominator is you can do them with just what we call small equipment and so that um, I think drove us to to create what we call the open studio because we were looking also you know you've got to look at a business it's not all fun and being creative you've also got to look at the cost side and, and the numbers and all those kinds of things and what bothered me was or what bothered us was that um, you know when you build a club whether it's a you know a fitness hut is around a thousand eight hundred square meters you know of course a home's place or a typical health club is three and a half to five thousand square meters but whatever the size of the club when you have studios like dedicated group fitness studios like spinning studios or cycle studios or uh, body pump studios etc that's a room which might be 150 200 250 square meters which is dedicated to classes so it's great when it's being used and if it's very big you might have 30 people in there getting a good workout but even if you have a very big uh sorry a very um yeah a, a large group fitness schedule typically studios are more are empty for more hours than they're full right so they stand idle they stand empty and the problem there is you've got let's say 200 square meters of studio which cost more than the rest of the club because they have dedicated air conditioning and they've got more technology and more lighting so on a per square meter basis that's one of the most expensive parts of the club standing empty and so we said, how can we uh, aproveitar, how can we, how can we make the most out of that space? And uh, we said, well, let's do an open studio. And so we were the first, uh, the first chain or the first gyms, I, I think anywhere in Europe to start doing this. We said, next to our traditional gym, we're gonna put in uh, a studio, which is gonna be open. We're gonna put um, athletic flooring in, so that's that, that, that green flooring. And we're going to try and create the, the feeling or the ambient of this is kind of an athletic tr training uh, playground, you know, with, the, with the, the meters on the floor. We're going to have a lot of cool small equipment, you know, medicine balls and kettlebells and things like that. And we're going to use that, that space when there are traditional classes, which are essentially using the space, but also open. And we got lots of feedback from people saying, that won't work because the noise and people are going to feel exposed and nobody's done it before and it works really well and not only does it work well for the people in the classes but it works well for people who aren't in the classes because what we wanted one of the the, the points we were trying to achieve was to create a sense of openness and energy being transferred and of course if you close every every aspect up the energy has to stay in that in that zone whereas it, now if you go to a fitness hut at a peak time and you've got a class of 20 people doing group doing a group fitness class in the open studio if you're working out somewhere else that energy is coming over and being it's, it's you know it's spreading you know you can hear the, the music you can hear people going woo woo. you can see stuff going on so it creates a kind of vibe which i think adds in a kind of well it definitely adds to the experience and most importantly, we are making the most of those square meters, even when there's not group fitness classes on, because when there are, of course, people go on and use, use that space for themselves. And you mentioned a lot doing something that you pursue that you love. Yeah. And you linked to it at, at the beginning about leaving home's place and your, your decision of, am I going to be the one fighting to maintain market share or am I going to be the one creating something new? But do you have any tips on, I wouldn't say quitting the corporate ladder, but knowing yeah. when to jump off and pursuing yes that, I mean look a dream it, that everyone has yeah I think it's easy for me to say in hindsight uh, you know I would say a couple of things one uh, it's I, I finally did it because I was really stressed and I think it's quite normal you know I was in a really well-paid job I, I was the, the leader but I wasn't happy and I wasn't identifying anymore with the company I was leading. And once you've got a leader who doesn't identify with the company, that's a pretty dangerous or certainly it's a dysfunctional situation. But it is very hard to leave a big salary and jump in, just based upon an idea. So I, I completely understand when people don't do it. Uh, and it becomes, you know, luckily for me, looking back, I didn't feel lucky at the time. Uh, I, I was in a really essentially nasty aggressive environment because I was fighting with the chairman I was the CEO and I was fighting with the chairman so actually the nastiness and the sense of annoyance if you like actually helped me leave I think if things had been running smoothly 
I probably never would have pursued my dream and, and you know, started my own company. So uh, I think one of the things I wish I'd done differently is I wish I'd done it earlier. I mean, it worked out fine, but uh, I think if you work for a long time in the corporate environment, you, there's a risk of, and, and bearing in mind, I worked for the same company <laughs> for 20 years. I'd never worked anywhere else. Or, albeit in different countries and in different uh, roles, I'd only worked in Holmes Place. And if you do that, you have a day, if you don't have, a, a, you know, if you're not super confident or super sure of your own, uh, sure, sure of yourself, you can lose perspective on your own value, if that makes sense. So I, I felt very nervous about whether or not I would be taken seriously once I left Holmes Place. And of course I, I was, you know, we raised finance and we did fine in terms of getting the, the business going. So my advice would be, be confident. Don't just wait for things to get bad before you have the balls to, to pursue your dream. But also don't underestimate the benefit of corporate life because, um, you know, most new ventures fail. And uh, I think one of the reasons they might fail is because people think, well, it's easy. I know how to do it. And if you actually, objectively look at them and their curriculum and their history they don't have any experience in it so well what do you expect so when I uh, left to start this business with my two colleagues I think we had something like 50 years of experience between us so you know so that's a little bit so it was a startup but it's a quite it's a I felt very confident it was going to work it would it wasn't like saying okay I think I'm going to do that you know so I'd, I'd caution people being too exuberant or, or overly confident, but I definitely would say once you've got your experience and you, you think you can do it, don't, don't hang around for too long. That's one thing we wanted to ask you because you said you wish to have done it earlier. Yeah. But how much, uh, how important it was to gain experience in the red ocean, so to say, before yeah. actually going to the blue ocean with an innovation? Look, I mean, I think, you know, Particularly now with uh, with tech and online, the internet and social media, you know, you, you can see lots of relatively young people, younger and younger it seems, starting businesses which are successful. So I think it would be completely wrong for me to say, oh, you need 15 years before you before you move. It's just that's just not true. Um, and one of the one of the businesses I follow um, with, in awe is a company called. Uh, Gymshark. I don't know if you've heard of Gymshark. So these guys, they're, they're, like, they're your age. They're like, I think they're 25, 26, and they started it at uni. And that company is phenomenal. If you look at the growth and the, how well it's done and continues to do. So those, they had no experience. So I, I think it would be arrogant to say, this is my prescription for success because different people, different sectors. But I think probably the, on, on balance, I would suggest you do need to, as you put it quite well, swim in the red ocean, uh, if not for anything else, because it helps you learn, as I said at the beginning, which are the headaches to avoid, you know, which are the battles you want to just sidestep and not get into, that kind of thing. So I think it gives you experience and perspective when you're starting out. Yeah, and you obviously started uh, Fitness Set when we started recovering from the financial crisis in 2011. Um, you apply this blue ocean strategy. Do you predict that similar opportunities will arise in the future months? I do. I mean, I, you know, I sold Fitness Hut in um, 2018 and then I reinvested <laughs> in it. So I, I, I'm a, a shareholder in, in the existing Fitness Hut. And so I'm watching and suffering as I see the, ex the, the effects of C19, the restrictions on gyms and you know, essentially what's happening, not just in Fitness Hut, but in all gyms in Portugal and all over the world, um, apart from one, one or two uh, countries. Uh, you know, gyms, the traditional gym of a place, a physical space where people go, uh, is under threat because of the fear that people have about C19 and also because people have discovered during lockdown new ways to exercise, um, you know. And so I think that stress and uh, uh, you know businesses suffering it, it's it's horrible people lose jobs people get stressed etc etc but it is also an environment within which people will have to innovate so my my prediction is that um, not, not just within fitness but in many sectors the effects of the last uh, let's say the last four months and the next year I, I don't know year or less 
are going to be that uh, as, lo- as well as lots of business failures and redundancies, there's going to be a, a massive uh, number of, uh, of companies and people innovating new, new things. So I think the Blue Ocean, whether or not people read Blue Ocean strategy or not, there's going to be a lot of thinking and a lot of things developed which are completely disruptive and completely new, you know, driven by the needs and the, the restrictions and the new ways of thinking uh, and the ways in which people are being conditioned behaviourally because of C19. You talked about when you and these other diversified investments you're making after Fitness Hut, you yeah. look more towards the people who are actually managing the yeah. investment rather than the investment itself. You, earlier you talked about the restaurant where it's something yeah. you, you're not a chef or a restaurant to by heart, but do you still apply the blue ocean strategies when you're looking at those investments or do you weigh, does it weigh more upon you, the, the people who are actually... Uh, both. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I made some investments and uh, it was a combination of the, the product or the, yeah, the product and the people, their passion. And uh, yeah, the, I want, I want the, the company or the proposition or the product to be not just one more thing, but done better. It's got to have a certain USP or a certain cachet or a certain disruptiveness. Um, and then, yeah, the restaurant, uh, in fact, just today, uh, sorry, just earlier this week, I was having a conversation with my, with my two uh, partners because we noticed that the chef was, I suppose, I don't know if it's consciously or subconsciously, was slowly veering away from the blue ocean in terms of some of the food. And we, we said, look, we need to get him to really, really get back into the blue ocean. And for, for us, that means, you know, we, we have a sushi restaurant, but it's fusion, which means it's not just sushi, it's, it's sushi Latino. And we need to hold on to the Latino, otherwise we'll just become a, another good sushi restaurant. And, and, and our commitment, the, the money we invested, the things we want to do are based upon it being not just a sushi restaurant. So making this chef aware of that, challenging him, you know, insisting and hopefully taking him with us to ensure that it, it keeps that identity, which is the original, was the original idea. Uh, I've asked you this before, four years ago, when I got accepted at the university. But I want to ask you again, because you are by far uh, one of the best public speakers I know. What advice can you give us and whoever's listening about speaking in public? Ah. <laughs> oh, do you know what? When I was, um, I, I had a, a real fear of speaking in public um, for, for many years. And I only overcame that fear in my, in my mid-30s, which is crazy because I was CEO of a big company and had to make speeches uh, and I'm very confident in small groups. Um, and so, of course, like all fears, I mean, we were talking earlier about jiu-jitsu and my fear of fighting. And I addressed that by committing to doing tournaments and trying to overcome fear by regularly fighting. And actually, I never really <laughs> overcame it. Um, but in terms of public speaking, I did what many people do, which is I just avoided it at, at all costs, whenever I could, which obviously doesn't help you ever overcome it. And then I think what happened was I was forced because of circumstances to make two or three talks within a relatively short time. And that helped, I kind of almost subconsciously realized, actually it's slightly less painful, slightly less painful. So really there's two things I would say. One is the more you do it and the more frequently you do it, the more confident you become, which is obvious. And two is, and this really helped me, is it dawned on me uh, because I was always talking about fitness, it dawned on me that uh, the people who are there listening to me want to hear what I've got to say, and two, I know more than they do about the thing I'm talking about. And I don't mean that in an arrogant way, because I'm not talking about fitness in general, I'm not a fitness guru, but I was generally talking about my company. And then, of course, for me it becomes a conversation, or a monologue, like, like this is, I can talk for hours and days about Fitness Hut because it's my thing. Uh, but even before Fitness Hut, I had discovered this ability or confidence coming from talking about stuff I, I was all over. I, you know, and because I said earlier I'm quite freestyle, I almost didn't need notes. You, know, you can ask me a question and I can go anywhere and talk in detail about it because it's the thing I know. So slowly but surely I overcame it. And, and it, my, I gave a speech, or a, sorry, two presentations in China last year to thousands of well a thousand people and it was just not a problem at all 
Firstly, because they couldn't understand what I was saying, because they were all Chinese. <laughs> they were listening to the, uh, to the translator. Uh, but no, it was, it was just fine. So it was, it was something that just, the sooner you get on with it and start doing it and commit to it, uh, the sooner you, you get past that fear idea. All right, thank you very much, Nick. That thank was you, Nick. That was really You're awesome. Cool. Thanks. Thank you. Yes. <laughs>